द डायमंड सूत्र एनलाइटमेंट द सडन एक्सप्लोशन इज एनलाइटमेंट अ ग्रेजुअल प्रोसेस और समथिंग एल्स एनलाइटमेंट ऑलवेज हैपेंस लाइक लाइटनिंग इट इज इन फ्लैश it is a sudden explosion it cannot come gradually because it cannot be divided you cannot have enlightenment in bits and pieces you cannot say that i am little bit enlightened and this word enlightenment is used in a very loose sense someone will come and you are explaining something to him he said would you please enlighten me enlightenment happens on one's own it is in communion with the existence when you are ready all of a sudden there is an explosion between you and the holy Yes indeed the preparation for enlightenment happens slowly and slowly the preparation happens slowly and slowly you are visiting a city for the first time you reach to the city late in the evening and by the time you settled in your room it's almost 10 o'clock in the night what you will do first you will try to settle in the room and then maybe you may take a shower change your clothes then you would like to have a view of outside but it is a cold wintry night so you go up to the window open the drape and try to have a view of the light glimmering in its majestic splendor you get a view this is a preparation you want to see what it is going on you have come to a different place where you have never been so this happens slowly and slowly the preparation then imagination comes because what you are looking at the outside is like a framed image when you take a picture the lens of the camera captures the image between a certain frame and that is why it is called a framed image but when you try to go out of the room you are under the open sky you can feel the breeze you may witness the snow falling cold breeze may be rushing through your bones you may be feeling cold there is a joy of its own this is not a gradual process this happens suddenly as soon as you decided to come out the whole of the existence the flowers the snow and everything starts falling over you and it starts the snow will start wetting you up in between the light the rays of the sun all this happens all of a sudden the preparation for enlightenment happens slowly and slowly and the preparation requires the dissolution of ego when the process of dissolution of ego begins it may happen suddenly 
or as a slow process. Usually the dissolution of ego happens bit by bit. Ego dissolves slowly and slowly. As ego dissolves, you feel more and more contented. This is not enlightenment. Instead, this is the ground in which enlightenment happens, a preparation. The ground can be prepared gradually, but the explosion happens all of a sudden. In fact, preparation has to be gradual. You cannot prepare the ground like lightning in a flash. Sometimes it takes lives to prepare the ground. Sufis never initiate any aspirant in a hurry. Sometimes the aspirant has to wait for years or even lives. All this is the period for inner preparation. Whenever the master finds you are on the borderline of the metaphysical sleep, he initiates you. The preparation for Buddhahood is a gradual process, but the actual happening of Buddhahood is a sudden explosion in you. Buddha wandered for a long period of time. For six months he lived on one grain of rice, he did this and that, the body has become so weak and frail, he was trying to cross the Niranjana river which is a shallow stony river to go on the other side. Almost when he reached to the shore he fell, he didn't have the courage, didn't have the strength to get up. A tree was leaning from the shore of other shore. He held on to its branch. A thought came to his mind. If he cannot cross this ordinary river, what will happen when he reaches to the other shore of enlightenment happens? Somehow or the other he remained Watching the stars, one by one, all the stars disappeared. Buddha somehow came out of the river. He prepared a bed and sat under that. Same time, a woman named Sujat came and she brought some sweet rice for him. Buddha ate that and having eaten, he got some strength and he sat in meditation. And when he sat in meditation, that's the time the explosion happened. The preparation for Buddhahood is gradual process, but the actual happening of Buddhahood is a sudden explosion in you. It is like the growth of fetus and the birth. Fetus takes nine months to grow. From the time of fertilization to childbirth is a long process. And when everything is ready, the child is born. Even the process of childbirth may be long, but the actual birth happens in a flash. So is the birth of Buddhahood in you. It takes long in preparation. And then suddenly in a flash the ultimate happens. First the contentment comes, you enter your inner space, you drown in your aloneness. This is the beginning. You are moving on the far right track, become more and more contented. The day you are utterly contented, the flash of enlightenment happens. The day you are utterly contented, the flash of enlightenment happens. So it is always a, a gradual process of preparation and then all of a sudden 
like a lightning it happens. Subhati asked Buddha about the taste of enlightenment. And Buddha says, and Subhati, because Subhati in these bodhisattvas, no preparation of self takes place, no preparation of a being, no preparation of a soul, no preparation of a person, no, nor do these bodhisattvas have a preparation of a dham, a preparation of no dham or no preparation or non-preparation takes place in them. And why? If Subhuti, these bodhisattvas should have a preparation of either a dham or no dham, they would thereby seize on a self, on a being, on a soul, on a person. And why? Because bodhisattva should not seize on either a dham or no dham. Therefore, this saying has been taught by Tathagat with a hidden meaning by those who know the discourse on dham as like unto a raft dham should be forsaken is still more so no dham. The Lord asked, What do you think, Subhuti, is there any dham which the Tathagat has fully known as the utmost right and perfect enlightenment? Or is there any dham which the Tathagat has demonstrated? Subhuti replied, No, not. As I understand what the Lord has said and why. This dham, the principle which Tathagat has fully known or demonstrated, cannot be grasped. It cannot be talked about and it is neither a dham nor a no dham. You cannot confine it within the boundaries. And why? Because the Absolute exalts the holy persons. This is the taste of enlightenment. In the last Sutra, Subhuti asked, Will there be any being in the last epoch at the time of the collapse of good doctrine? Who will be able to understand the Dham? Buddha said, Do not speak thus, Subhuti. Yes, even when there will be beings who will understand the truth, even one single thought of serene faith is enough to transform a man. Know they are Subhuti, known they are Subhuti. Subhuti to Tathagat through his Buddha cognition. Seen they are Subhuti by the Tathagat with his Buddha eye. Fully known Subhuti they are to Tathagat. Try to understand a few things before. Then it will be easier to enter these sutras. Taste of enlightenment. First, what is that Buddha calls the good doctrine or the dham? Buddha calls a good doctrine if it is not a doctrine. If it is a doctrine, it is not the good one. Buddha calls a philosophy good. Philosophy, if it is not a philosophy, if it is a philosophy, then it can be good. A doctrine is a set of fixed phenomena 
everything is a fixed phenomena you have to work within the framework the universe is in an instability it is constantly in a flux there is nothing rigid nothing fixed you cannot make a doctrine for the breeze to blow how the breeze will blow how the snow will fall all this is existential no law nothing can happen the breeze is blowing in a haphazard manner not as a doctrine in doctrine in philosophy everything is fixed the doctrine is a set or a fixed phenomenon the universe is in instability therefore no doctrine can can contain it no doctrine can be just to it and also no doctrine can do justice to the ex existence all doctrine ultimately falls short all philosophies or religions and doctrines are indeed incapable to contain the totality of existence that is why sufis say along the path in the beginning these strict rituals the methodologies the techniques are important but then a stage comes when you have to leave everything there is a watertight classification up to a certain stage you are studying different disciplines there are students who are studying different disciplines but when you enter into nasa and enter into a space field do you think there can be a watertight classification you can study statistics by itself you can study mathematics by itself you can study the comp composition in english language by itself but when you have to write your thesis you have to put all these together the statistics the mathematics the command on the language and all these things put together when a person goes into the space he has to be trained in many disciplines all that was a watertight classification seems to have mixed into one another there is no separation so when it comes to existence all philosophies all religions all doctrines are indeed incapable to contain the totality of the existence and the word tau that lawsey coin explains that which is cannot be contained in the finiteness of the word or anything else so buddha says my doctrine is not a doctrine but just a vision i have not given you any set rules i have not given you a system he says i have only given you an approach towards reality I have only given you the keys how to open the door. I have not said anything what would you see when you open the door. Nothing can be said about that. I have simply tried to give you the vision so that you can see for yourself. I gave you the key. You use the key to open the door and see for yourself just think of a man who has lived always in a dark cave who knows nothing of light who knows nothing of color who has never seen the sun or the moon how can you tell him about the rainbows 
How can you tell him about the sunlight, the moonlight? How can you talk to him about the stars? How can you describe the beauty of the roses to him? It is impossible. And whatsoever you say to him, if he understands, it will be wrong. He will create a doctrine and that too will be wrong again. So Buddha says, I have not given any doctrine to you. I have simply given you the key to open the door so that you can come out of the dark cave under the sunlight and the moment you come under the sunlight cave of your from the cave of your being or your ignorance you can see yourself what is the case buddha uses the word for this yatha bhut as it is I cannot describe you when you come out of the open, come out of the door, under the open sky, what will happen? Whatsoever will happen will be your own experience. No two people will experience this in the same way. Nothing has been said about it and that is why it is not a doctrine. Buddha is not a philosopher. Indeed, he is a physician. That is exactly what he said. Whenever anybody asked if he was a philosopher, Buddha's terse reply was, I am a physician, not a philosopher. Indeed, a Buddha or a master is a physician, while a philosopher is the one who goes on talking about color and light to a blind man goes on confusing him more and more. The blind man is incapable of understanding anything about light. Buddha says, I am not going to philosophize about light. I will simply give you a medicine, a technique, or I will try to cure your eyes. Then you can see for yourself. In Vidyan Bhairav Tantra, Devi sitting on the lap of Shiva in a state of great reverence and love asked Shiva, what is thy reality? What is this wonderful universe? She goes on asking the questions and in response to each question, Shiva gives a technique, a technique of meditation. Once you follow that mathematically, then you will ultimately know what it is. Patanjali gave techniques in Patanjali Yoga Sutra, the Kashmiri enlightened master. And they are so mathematical, if you follow them, you will ultimately reach to the destination. They are like a road map. A GPS system. You follow it. Is GPS system a philosophy? Is Google map a philosophy? This is exactly what it is. As you go 100 meters, you turn left, you go 200 meters, then you turn again, the indication comes in very mathematical and scientific. Buddha says, I am not going to philosophize about light. I will simply give you a medicine or I will try to cure your eyes. Then you can see for yourself. And this he calls as good doctrine. This is called dham. This is a totally a different vision. There is yet another thing to understand. Buddha says to Subhuti, Do not speak thus. Why? Because this idea has been persistently arising in people, even in people like Subhuti, who is of highest spiritual qualities. 
that they are special, that their time is special, that their age is special, and that never again will people be able to touch such heights. This is an egoistic, a subtle egoistic attitude. It shows much about Subhuti. He is still carrying a subtle ego in him. A subtle ego. Down the ages, most, almost all people have suffered from this disease called ego disease. And almost everyone suffers from this disease in one way or the other. They think that their time is something special. You hear the religious people, the golden age was beautiful. The age when Ram incarnated it was good. If it was good then there would have been no atrocities taking place. But these happened. So he said this is a, the black age. More negativities are taking place. Or the golden age or the other ages were free from negativities? No, they were not. They think their time is something special. No time is special. God is available in all times. Hindus use the word eternal for God. The word eternal implies that which is beyond time and space. And yet still Hindus world over say that now nobody can become enlightened because it is the age of Sin Kalyug. It is the last, the dirtiest stage. It is the age of darkness. Nobody can become enlightened in the age of darkness. Then how Buddhas and Jesus and Muhammads happened. Can't you see the play of ignorance and ego in the people who are considered the custodian of religion? What can be done when ego protects? The ignorance and ignorance is the ornament of ego. Remember, ego protects the ignorance and ignorance is the ornament of ego. A person who is egoistic he is ignorant as well. Together both ignorance and ego becloud the manifestation of truth. Jan says nobody can become enlightened because it is the fifth epoch or Pancham core. Even Buddhists who are perfectly aware of the Diamond Sutra Go on saying that nobody can become enlightened in this age. And even they try to interpret Buddha's words in such a way that it starts appearing as if nobody can become enlightened. I was reading a commentary on the, on the Diamond Sutra and the commentator was saying he is trying to interpret the message of Buddha However, without inner preparation, he failed to represent the Buddha. Unless you are a Buddha yourself, you will not be able to understand the message of Buddha. If the world is not religious, it is because of such people. The commentary says, yes, Buddha says that people will be there who will be able to understand a little bit of truth and great will be their merit. But merit is not enlightenment, it is just the ground. So the interpreter contends, in this age nobody can become enlightened. At the most you can attain to certain merits. You have to wait for the right age to become enlightened. Your merit will be of great help, but it is just the foundation. You cannot make this shine right now. 
This is how the people go on. What Buddha is saying is simply a fact. No time is special as has been conceived by many. All times remain similar for the seeker and so is the case for non-seeker. During Buddha's time, there were millions of people who never became enlightened. Enlightenment is not like a spring season. It is not like it is not that when a spring season comes, all the trees blossom. If that be the case, then all the people during Buddha's time would have become enlightened. In reality, only a few people became enlightened. So it is not like the spring of enlightenment has come. It is not a question of climate. It, this does not mean that a particular time is auspicious and that makes people enlightened. Those who seek and search, they will attain whatever be the time. Those who do not seek and search, they will not attain even if the time is auspicious. Time does not matter and the time remains the same. The time is neither good nor bad. Time is neither for enlightenment nor against it. Whatsoever you want your life to become, time will give you that opportunity. Whatsoever doesn't matter. Whatsoever you want your life to become, Time will give you the opportunity. Time is impartial just like sun. It does not impose anything on you. Both time and sun never change your decision. Time and sun simply give you freedom and opportunity. It is up to you what you make of that opportunity. You can become enlightened, as enlightened as you desire. Or you can remain as unenlightened. The choice is always yours. Existence cooperates with you. But this idea arises again and again out of ignorance as the function of ego. I have come across many scriptures of the world. People think what will happen to others in the future. This idea persists even in the ordinary human beings. It is said the time of Shah Bahauddin Naqshband was much better. But the present day time has many more opportunities. There if a seeker has to come, he has to travel far and wide to reach to the company of the Sheikh. Now, the technology, the modern day science has made it so easy. Within a flash you can be in communion. But this idea has arises again and again out of ignorance as the function of ego. I have come many scriptures of the world. People think what will happen to others in the future. This idea persists even in ordinary human beings. You will find old men talking of his times as better than the current. Those were indeed beautiful days. Those were golden days. There was something special then. Now there is nothing in the world. And remember when you become old, you will tell your children the same long and tall tales. And you will again say, those were the good days. I have heard about a man who went to London when he was 70 with his wife who was almost 68. They looked around and the old man said, things seem to have changed here. London is not London anymore. I have come 50 years ago when I was 20. That was real London. More alive and bubbling, the woman laughed. 
Remember, women are more earthly and pragmatic too. She said, my understanding is different. I think, I think you are less bubbling and alive now. That is old, you are old, but London is still young and the same as it was then. When he came 50 years ago, he was 20 years, he was bubbling and you find everything bubbling with new life. Now after 70 years, his energies have depleted and as he is, he will see everything around. Just look at the young people, they are enjoying as much as you have enjoyed when you were young. Now for the man who is 70, London seems nothing. London is its historicity and the nightlife. But for a man who is old in his 70s, it is irrelevant. He is no more so foolish to enjoy it. He is no more that young to be fool, so foolish. Dreams have disappeared from his eyes and definitely his wife is right to say you are not you but the city of London is seen. It happens to you too. You start thinking that those days of your childhood were beautiful. You now things are not so good. You feel sorry for the kids who are living now. You do not know they will feel sorry for their kids again when their time comes. This has always been so and every man thinks his time has been a, of a special quality. But Buddha says, do not speak the subhuti. Why? Because all times have the same quality. Space and time are not corrupted by man. No, these cannot be corrupted. You cannot even catch hold of time. How can you corrupt it then? They are not polluted in any way. You can pollute air and the sea, but you cannot pollute time. Can you? How can you pollute time? You cannot even catch hold of time. By the time you catch hold of the time, it rolls into the next moment. By the time you become aware of the moment, the moment is gone, it is no more. It has already become the past. It has already become the history. You cannot pollute time. Time is one of the most pure phenomenon. It is always pure. That is the reason Buddha tells Subhuti, do not speak the Subhuti. Yes, even then there will be beings who will understand truth. Remember Subhuti, truth is not a quality that happens sometimes and does not happen other times. Truth is always there. That is what is called why it is called truth, that which is always there beyond time and space, truth. Truth has nothing to do with time. Truth is eternal beyond time and space. You can attain to truth in the day. You can attain to it in the night. You can attain to truth in the marketplace or in the Himalayan mountain. You can attain to truth even being a man or a woman or a child or a young man or an old man. You can attain to truth any moment, any place because truth is always available. Now you just have to become available to it. And Buddha continues. Even one single thought of serene faith, even one single thought of serene faith is enough to transform a man. 
one single thought of seeing faith? What is faith according to Buddha? Ordinarily, faith is meant to be fear. Faith is nothing but fear. If you go to your place of worship, you will find people frightened. They are frightened of life and death. So they are just seeking some kind of shelter in some God. You see the feeling of helplessness in them who are seeking some security somewhere or missing their father and their mother and projecting some father or mother there in the heaven. They are not mature enough. They cannot live without their parents. Both parents may not be any more alive, but they are still children. They need some apron to cling to. They need somebody. They cannot live on their own and they cannot trust themselves either. When you are afraid and because of your fear you become religious, this is not the essence that Buddha is speaking of. Religion, this is ape religion, simply imitative. Out of fear, only imitation can arise. What does Buddha mean when he uses the word faith? Faith is English word and does not explain the essence of Buddha. The real word is Shraddha. In Sanskrit, the, the word is Shraddha. It does not really imply faith. Shraddha means self-confidence or faith in oneself. It is a totally a different religion. Buddha calls it as the right religion and the other religion he calls as wrong. If you approach truth out of fear and trembling, you are approaching in a wrong way. And when you are approaching in a wrong way, whatsoever you come to see and feel will certainly be wrong. Both your eyes and heart are wrong. Truth cannot be known out of fear. To know truth, you have to be fearless. Shraddha is needed. A confidence in oneself is indeed and a trust in one's own being is needed. One should approach the reality out of trust, not out of fear. The essence of faith or trust is letting go. The fearful man can never let go. Out of fear you always need a defense. He is always protecting himself and fighting. He is always looking for protection here and a protection there. Even his prayer and his meditation is nothing but a strategy to project. The man of faith knows how to let go. The man of faith knows how to surrender. The man of faith knows how to flow with the river and not to fight with it. He goes with the stream wherever it takes him to. He has that courage and confidence that he can move with the stream, whether up or down. This is my experience and observation as well. A fearful person is always incapable to surrender. He thinks he is so strong that he cannot surrender. Nobody likes to feel that he is weak. Particularly the weakling never likes it. They never want to come to the realization that they are weak. Powered as well, they think they are very strong and therefore they cannot surrender. For the stronger the person is, surrender becomes easy. 
Only a strong man can really surrender because he trusts himself. He is confident of himself and he knows that he can let go. He is not afraid. He is ready to explore the unknown. He is ready to go into the uncharted region. He is thrilled by the journey of the unknown. He wants to taste he wants to taste the unknown irrespective of the cost and the risk. He wants to live in danger. A man of faith always lives in danger. Danger is his shelter. Insecurity is his security. And a tremendous inquiring quest is his only love. He wants to explore and to go to the very end of the existence or to the very depth of the existence or to the very height of it. He wants to know what it is that surrounds me. He is on the voyage to know I, to know who am I. A strong man is ready to surrender. He knows that there is no need to fear. He knows very well that he belongs to existence. And he is not a stranger here. Existence has nourished me. Therefore, I cannot be enemy. That, therefore, it cannot be inimical to me. Existence has brought me here. I am a part of it. Existence has some destiny to fulfill through me. The strong man always feels that he is here to do something that is needed by the existence and no one else can do it except me. Otherwise, why should I be created in the first place? God wants to fulfill himself through me. That's why he created me. So he is always ready to go into the dark to see. This is what Buddha calls Shraddha. It is better to translate it as Shraddha. But Buddha now adds another condition to it, serene 